And if you ask yourself that question, you know, you have to want the answer, which is rather demanding, let's say. You're, you're, it's another example of orienting yourself properly. So your aim is to get the answer to this question. And your perceptions and your thoughts will organize themselves around that question and you'll get answered. Like they'll rise up, you know, in that mysterious way that thoughts rise up. And some of them you'll find uncomfortable because your, your mind will present you with demands to do things that you may have been avoiding or that you find difficult or challenging. But you can, you can train yourself to set yourself a list of tasks for the day that do put you in better shape that night than you were in the morning. It doesn't help to shy away from difficult issues because you're stuck with them. They're not going away. The best you can do is something worthwhile in the face of it. And so you figure out what that worthwhile thing is, and then that gives you, and then you practice implementing. That gives you some character and some strength, and that's the sort of thing that can help transform you into a leader. What you do is actually important, and what you leave undone as well. Both of those things. Like each individual is more significant and more and has more impact than than they think, for better or for worse. I mean, you can think about it this way, you know, in your lifetime you're going to influence, directly influence at least a thousand people, and each of those thousand people will influence a thousand, and so that's a million people, one person separated from you, and a billion people, two people separated from you. We live in a network, and we're really tightly associated with one another, and if you hold your head high and you confront the future courageously and you put your life together and you develop a, a, a integrated and valuable plan and you implement it and you're a trustworthy person, you have an unbelievably positive effect on everything around you. And so it actually matters that you do these things. And it, it doesn't, I don't believe that it really matters where in the formal power hierarchy you sit. You know, because you might think, well, I'm at the bottom of the power rungs. What influence do I have? I think that's a bad way of thinking about it because it doesn't take into account the network issue. And so if you don't want things to be worse, which you wouldn't if you were a sensible person, then it would probably be better to work hard to make them better and to all that you, you are playing a determining role in how reality unfolds when you're doing something. far more powerful forces for good and evil than they believe. If you ask people what they regret, um, especially as they get older, what they generally report is things not done. So they don't regret so much mistakes they've made, although of course people obviously regret mistakes they've made as well. So they don't exactly regret sins of commission, right? Errors that they've actively made. They, they miss, they, 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 they torment themselves for opportunities that had presented themselves that they did not, let's say, exploit or engage in. And I think that's worth thinking about too, because one thing that I have become convinced about with regards to human consciousness, uh, which I think is equivalent to the spark of divinity in some sense that our fundamental stories insist has been placed within us, is that human consciousness is that faculty that confronts potential itself. I think there's good neurological evidence for this, by the way, for those of you who are scientifically minded, because um, we build circuits within us for habitual action that we practice many times that seem to run in a very deterministic fashion. And we are a strange combination of deterministic and non-deterministic as far as I can tell. But what our consciousness seems to be for is to encounter those things that we have not yet encountered. And those things that we have not yet encountered seem to me to be those things that have not yet been brought into being. And so you could say that what our consciousness is for is for the encounter with potential. You know, that our consciousness is for the, it's not for the past, it's not even for the present. It's to transform the future into the present. 
and, and really that that's what our consciousness does. When you wake up in the morning, you have a new day ahead of you, and the day could take you in very many directions, and, and the weeks and the years, all of that, could take you in very many directions, and you have some apprehension about what those directions might be. You have some apprehension about what role your choices might make in transforming that potential into one form of actuality or another. I mean, you certainly know that there are dreadful mistakes you might be very tempted to make that would produce all manner of hell around you and still be tempted to do it. It seems like it's sitting there right in front of you as a possibility. You also know that, you know, you could haul yourself up out of bed and attend to your duties and do the sorts of things that you're supposed to and set a few things right that day and that week and then likely things would at least not be worse and they would probably be better and uh, I, I believe that I do believe that I, I don't understand how this can be the case I don't understand how it is that consciousness can, consciousness can function in that way because I think to understand that we would have to understand what it means for the future to be only potential rather than actuality and who the hell understands that i mean no one and then we'd have to understand how it is that our conscious choices and our conscious ethical choices transform that potentiality into actuality into reality into the present and the past and we certainly well, we certainly act as if we believe that that's what we do we upgrade ourselves, for example, when we do a bad job of it, we're upset with our children and those we love if we don't believe that they're living up to their potential. We're guilty and ashamed when we make choices that we feel are inappropriate. We understand to some degree that the manner in which time lays itself out has something to do with the ethics of our choice. And again, I would say that's a very deep idea. I think it's a, I think it's, I think it's the most true idea I know. It's very emphasized, that idea emphasized in ancient religious stories such as those that are outlined in Genesis, or Genesis with strange insistence that, you know, God is that which brings order out of chaos, formless potential, generates the world out of formless potential, and that we're somehow made in that image, which, which seems to me to be the case and that the proper way by the way to go about acting in that image is to act in relationship to the potential that confronts you with truth and with courage careful articulation that's the logos and that if you do that then what you bring forth is is good to be precise in your speech does two things it specifies your goal and it reduces uncertainty. You see what you aim at. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I really don't, because you're a lot more blind than you think. There's a lot of the world that you don't see. You see most of what's in front of you in a very blurry way, like your peripheral vision is extremely low resolution. You see clearly a tiny focal area that, that's where you're pointing your eyes. And so, and you point your eyes at what you want to pay attention to. And what you want to pay attention to is generally associated with what you want. So what that means is that the world reveals itself to you in relationship to what you want. And so that's really helpful because you, you want to see the world so you don't stumble blindly through it and fall into a pit. You want to get to where you're going. And so, if you specify where you're going very clearly, then that enables you to see the pathway forward. Now, the upside to that is that you can probably get to where you want to go. The downside is you also make your conditions of failure very explicit. And that's hard on people in the short term. You know, it's, it's easy to delude yourself and to leave everything vague because then you can't tell when you're failing. But that doesn't stop you from failing. It just stops you from seeing it while it's happening. Then the other advantage to being precise in your speech and your aims is that that helps you tell the difference between what's important and what isn't important. And you want almost everything to be not important. You know, in times of crisis in your life, everything becomes important. So imagine that you have a, a new physical symptom that's distressing and you don't understand it. 
So then you're thinking, oh my God, what's happening? Am I collapsing physically? Am I, have I got a serious illness? Is it a fatal illness? What's going to happen to my family? Is my whole life going to fall apart? Like what happens when it's something that you can't specify occurs is that everything becomes relevant. And that's terrible. No one, no one ever wants that. You want hardly anything to be relevant. And so if you specify your goal, then almost everything becomes irrelevant. And only those things that are important stand up in sharp, in sharp relief. That's also a real boon to the people that you're communicating with because they know what you want then. And so they, even if you're a harsh person, let's say that you're pretty punitive and if people don't do a good job, you, you know, you let them know. If you specify what you want, then they know how to avoid your harshness. And the more precise you are in your formulation of the problem and in your presentation of a solution and the role you might play in that solution, the more likely you are to advance on all fronts. As far as I can tell, there's nothing you can do that moves you and your agenda, your vision, let's say, forward faster than precision in speed.